All right, so let's move up the stack a bit. And I'm gonna talk about how we deliver the performance of Flash up through some higher levels of the software stack into applications. So let's, let's set out a little bit of, bit of context. I mean, obviously we're talking about pretty advanced technology here, you know, all flash storage systems, high scale. So clearly we're working with the self-driving car folks. We have done a lot of work in the last year with an increased number of healthcare institutions, pharmaceuticals that are doing all kinds of drug discovery and, and various research, you know, fighting the pandemic and obviously other healthcare initiatives. And, you know, work with customers that launch rockets. There's all kinds of very high tech uses in practice, this product. But what about the insurance agencies? And what about the transportation providers? And what about you know, state and local governments? Do they need this kind of tech? And when we started the product, you know, we had a thesis obviously that this would be broadly applicable technology. The timing is always a big question. And so if you, if you look back actually in the Wayback Machine, Pure had some branding in 2013, it was called Flash for All. And you can even see our old slide templates were very much of that era. Uh, and the reality is this way of thinking, you know, marketing slogans come and go, but this way of thinking has really persisted across the company. We believe in you know, the all flash data center and, and solid state media and what it enables. But realistically today, you know, we, we think about as much as the core platform, we think about the use cases and the, the fact that across so many different industries, it's really about, yes, it's an all flash core, but it's about delivering performance for all. And so in practice, you know, it's, it's really a delight for us to be able to look at our customer base and talk to individuals, what's happening in their environment and see it's a broad range of different sizes and types of customers. You know, we have local newspapers that have brought in Flashblade and, and seen dramatic improvements in core performance, you know, storage performance. We've got one of the largest supercomputers in the UK that's running a lot of their, you know, software development and, and testing uh, on Flashblade. We've got regional healthcare providers that are improving patient outcomes. And performance comes in many flavors for many customers of sizes. And Part of uh, success for any product is making sure we can hit a broad base of different kinds of industries. And this is, you know, some testament to that. And so, but let's really, you know, from a technical point of view, let's unpack this. Like when we say performance, obviously from a storage perspective, we're talking about low latency. We're talking about, you know, high throughputs, file and object systems. So we're talking about metadata performance. We're talking about high bandwidth and IOPS. Like those are sort of obvious, I, I, would, I would say, but can you do this with large files? What about small files? Can we, do, can we deliver performance for random access patterns? Can we deliver performance for sequential access patterns? Per performance to us means so many different, you know, tackling all these different facets and dimensions. And, you know, it's something that we've, we've talked about internally for a long time is that Flash is it's an enabler. But by itself, it doesn't magically solve all these performance problems. And when I was in graduate school, my thesis advisor, um, he had a saying for, for, for what a lot of us as graduate students did. You know, we'd take a particular system design and we'd like hyper optimize one part of it. And he'd tell us, it's like you're putting Pirelli tires on a Yugo. And so for folks that might be, I don't know, under the age of 40, Yugo was a, a very economical car not known for its performance and Pirelli tires are, uh, go on your race car or Ferrari, I guess. Um, and that's a bit like, you know, it's a, it's a useful metaphor perhaps for what we see in the industry is a lot of the retrofits of, okay, SSDs are widely available. The economics continue to improve, you know, retrofitting those into existing storage systems. It does help. Let's be very clear. It absolutely helps. And a lot of very impressive engineering has gone into those retrofits but it's still not really solving the problem holistically. So what did, what did we do? And there's, there's a lot of tech under the covers. So I'll try, to, I'll try to highlight really three key things in a little bit more depth of how we've delivered this multi-dimensional performance that the hardware enables all the way through our system. And so it, the first is it, we, we set out to really build a database before we built a file system or before we built an object store, we built a high scale transactional database where we distribute everything across the system be able to maximally use every compute cycle we can get. And second, we, we've optimized the encodings and the physical layer of how we represent 
information in that database with knowing we were designing for flash, knowing that we'd have non-volatile memory uh, in the system to do variable block encoding, really efficient access methods for random, random access patterns and, and so on. And then finally, by engineering towards this direct access to flash, we can expose all the concurrency that exists at the media level all the way through the system. And as I was mentioning earlier, you know, kind of really co-designing and co-engineering the lower levels of the software stack that it can see directly into the media all the way through this database and into the you know, files and objects. So let's take each of these in a little bit more depth because it's a, I know it's a lot to, it can be a lot to take in. So at our core, is actually a database. And, you know, it's not a SQL database. You don't write transactions in the sort of usual Oracle SQL server style, but the internals follow a pretty tried and true architectural model. Now it's the implementation that's been heavily specialized knowing we're building a file and object storage for unstructured data on top, but the concepts of, you know, tables and building indexes and having distributed transactions and concurrency control protocols. These are well understood uh, technologies that need a lot of very careful implementation to, to scale and to get right. And so we, we took that approach and it's worked out really well. The key insight here is that we are sharding and distributing or partitioning everything across the system. So if you think about a file structure, you have inodes for files and directories, you have obviously the file data, you might have really large files, you have the physical layer where we have recent updates to metadata or data that might be an NVRAM. We have long-term data that's in various parts of Flash. Every piece of that information gets encoded in a effectively relational type structure that we partition and shard out across all the blades. And the reason we go to this sort of level of, of depth is really to drive home the point that by having that degree of distribution, we can parallelize all the backend operations across all the blades. So when you go from seven blades to 75 or 150 blades, we are adding the ability to increase the amount of compute we bring to the whole stack. And, and that's been really valuable as we scale the kinds of protocols we support, the kinds of data services we add, the amount of capacity in the system and having to keep up with you know, garbage collection or handling rebuilds in the event of a failure. And, so on and so forth. And so that achieving that parallelism has been, uh, you know, this, this database core architecture has been really key to that. And the last piece of, you know, the design principles here is that- Brian, I have a, yes. I have a question. How, how, how big is this database? How much space does it take on each blade? Uh, great question. It's a, it's a pretty small percentage relative. Obviously it varies with the, you know, kind of data that's stored, right? So if you have, very large individual files or objects, there's less metadata required. Um, but it's in, you know, we typically reserve in the 10 to 15% of the physical capacity uh, that, that we save for what we call system space, if you will. And that's part of that is this, you know, database. And so it's definitely, you know, we've designed it and sized the space reporting to be able to handle the extreme cases. And, you know, we have systems at customers that have hundred plus billion objects, you know, in them. And, you know, there's, there's no real issue there with, in terms of the database size and scaling. As the, uh, as the node density increases, is there any, um, I guess, increase in latency or, or backend network chatter between that control plane, between those nodes? Uh, not really. Um, it, you know, the, the backend, uh, the backend networking requirements are, they're, they're driven by two things. One is obviously front-end requests. You, you ask for some data, we have to get it, serve it, re-piece together you know, uh, portions of that that's been distributed across all the system. And so that scales more proportional to front-end traffic. Uh, the other piece is in the event of a node failure. And so that is, so if, if you pull a blade out of the system, we have to return you know, to redundancy. If that, if that blade has gone away for whatever reason, uh, we have to return the system to you know, full redundancy as, as quickly as we can. And so our design targets for that are always to try to hit within you know, 12 to 24 hours of full rebuild, assuming you're doing absolute max front end workload. And so that, you know, and that we carefully monitor this with respect to you know, field, expected field failure rates, right? There's it's all the sort of classic 
you know, even RAID schemes that, that you look at. Um, you know, we, we did, our design point is for, in very much the, the worst case, that means, you know, we, we do scale out uh, and, and there will be, you know, every time we build a bigger blade, we have to carefully look at, you know, do we have the appropriate compute requirements, networking requirements uh, to be able to serve those, those rebuild activities that happen. That's the main driver of, of the back end, you know, kind of workload that we might see. And, uh, you know, we, we, see a clear path to uh, continuing to scale this sort of core architecture that we have to handle, you know, future design points. So Brian, you mentioned the redundancy and the sharding and the distribution of, of all of the data. How much, um, how, how does that work? So how much redundancy is there? Like I can pull a blade out, that's fine. Um, how resilient is the device? So, you know, resilience uh, comes in many ways, many forms to deal with, because you have to solve for many different fault models in a, in a real system. And so it's, it's difficult to get a super short answer to that. Um, the data in that's kind of at rest in the flash, if you will, is always erasure encoded with either N plus two or N plus three in some designs and the system automatically figures out, you know, the right trade-off and choice to make there. So you can pull at least two blades out uh, you'll have a marginal performance degradation because we've removed those compute cores, uh, but all the data is still available. Uh, the NVRAM, you know, so data that's in flight that's uh, been recently recorded into NVRAM is triple replicated. So again, designing for that, being able to pull two blades out at any time and still have you know, all, all, all uh, confirmed writes uh, still there. The networking modules are uh, active, active, in a high availability pair. So you can pull one of them, you'll see performance degradation from the loss of networking you know, capacity, uh, but all the data is still available. Um, but there's also so much more resilience that we put in at the fine granularity, right? And this, just like any solid state media and even spinning disk systems, you know, our main goal is to recover from micro faults without affecting anything at a large. So anytime we can contain a fault and repair we do, and we have layers and layers and layers of technology to, to resolve uh, what I call you know, the smaller scale faults that are gonna be more frequent, but uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does, thanks. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's go a little deeper, right? So we have this database at the physical layer of that database, still in our software, we're encoding data on the assumption that we, we don't get to assume that all access is to very large files. We, we've, we've adopted a variable size encoding uh, for maximum efficiency. And if you look at some legacy scale out systems in particular that were really designed around spinning disk, you can see at small file sizes, there are some deep inefficiencies. And this really come, it, it, it's not because uh, of poor design choices. They were constrained by the media that was available at the time. And so if you have a one kilobyte file in some of these systems, they will pad to a disk block and then they'll triple replicate even at rest, so long-term. And you can see massive expansion factors. Now in an area of streaming audio, streaming video as the primary use case, for example, that may not be such a big deal if all your files come in you know, multi-megabyte or gigabyte chunks. But one of the things we found with uh, especially IoT systems and log telemetry data is that files and objects come in very small sizes sometimes, and they might get even rewritten. There's often some database system you know, at the software application layer that will try to do some packing, but sometimes not. Now, we had one customer that set up a very large Prometheus uh, database for their monitoring. And this is a top 20 SaaS vendor. So very large scale infrastructure. And uh, they're using, there's a, a database system called Cortex that plugs in the back end of, of Prometheus and it writes to S3 on the back end to actually store and persist the data. And they went away on a Friday with 3 billion objects in a bucket and came in on Monday to uh, 6 billion objects in the bucket. And we didn't miss a beat. There was no issue. They noticed it in some of their dashboards of, wait, this was a little unexpected. And, you know, this is the kind, you know, they had a configuration change in their environment that had started shipping tiny objects. And these are the kinds of variations that we have to deal with. And so we had to design a system that would be able to work with really tiny files. So if we get a one kilobyte file or a one byte file, 
uh, which happens more often than, than you'd think, uh, we have to be able to encode that. And obviously there's some metadata overhead, but we're, we're as close to you know, kind of optimal efficiency as, as we believe we can get there. Uh, and it's, re it's really made a difference for customers in varied workloads. Brian, you, you often mentioned you know, the small files and et cetera, but you never mentioned strong consistency. I mean, which is another factor that is really important for modern workloads, especially with object storage. Absolutely. Uh, so let's start on the file side for a second. So strong consistency is, uh, you know, an absolute requirement for traditional file workloads. If a write has happened, you know, and a read comes from that same client, we need to serve the same data that was just written. You know, there are obviously long histories with NFS and SMB of different ways of handling the uh, consistency between clients uh, that we uh, adhere to, you know, the standard specs on that. Object is an interesting space. And in fact, we were doing strong consistency just before Amazon was doing it. Uh, you know, that kind of goes back to the database, in, you know, internals uh, by treating this, you know, internal architecture as a transactional database. It, it allowed us to express, you know, a strongly consistent object store API uh, easily. So a write well, if you, if, if you have one client that writes that data and another one comes and reads it, we're gonna serve up the write that is already happening. So there is a, a strongly consistent view that we've had. We <laughs> amusingly, um, you know, we were very happy to see Amazon also support strong consistency uh, in S3 this year, uh, because we actually had customers that were saying, well, wait a second, now you're different from Amazon. My software, if, it, if we designed it with FlashBlade, if we wanted to also run in the cloud, it might not work. And so it's, it's nice to live in a strongly consistent world. And there's been a lot, uh, uh, Werner Vogels has a very nice write-up on why Amazon made this, made this jump to strong consistency. Uh, and and you know, we've, we've seen that from the beginning. So the, the other piece of hitting performance in a lot of different dimensions is, you know, <laughs> There's a lot we do for small files. We also have to handle large files. We had an early customer of FlashBlade in the energy sector who was doing high performance computing workloads. Their files were 20 terabytes. So they'd have a single file and they'd have a grid of computers, of servers that would come in and manipulate different chunks of that file. And I wouldn't call that necessarily optimal in, uh, in all ways, but this is how some HPC applications have been developed where you can you know, chunk out things and, and they want to think about the whole as just one large file that kind of has internal structure that they'll partition in their application. And so there are lots and lots of optimizations all the way through the software stack that are needed to be able to achieve performance on the one kilobyte file and the 20 terabyte file. And so we've, we've been able to really scale this core architecture to, you know, whether it's distributing large files out so that individual pieces can be handled independently how we're uh, coalescing metadata updates are lots and lots of uh, uh, deep optimization that's gone into the system to support, to support the varied requirements that we see in all different kinds of industries. So in the last, last element of this that I'll, I'll take you through in this deeper tech dive is, is this direct flash concept uh, that you know, we've, <clears throat> we, we made this bet right out of the gate with FlashBlade. We were not gonna go through a traditional uh, SSD interface. And if you look at, you know, the historical retrofit approach, what's happened is you, you take an SSD, which has its own little mini computer inside that runs a flash translation layer. There's usually about a gigabyte of DRAM for every terabyte of flash. And then you layer, you know, that might have a SATA interface and you put it in an enterprise storage system. So you need an interposer that bridges that to a dual port SAS and you're sort of working your way all and it pervades all the way up through the software stack. Okay, we can do better with NVMe, but there's still this flash translation layer that exposes a generic block device up where our approach from the beginning has always been, let our software see all the way down to the media. Now, our, the higher levels of our software in the upper layers of their database and the protocol layer, they don't need to know what's going on on block 75 of LUN 4 and plane 2. So we've created really robust abstractions all the way through the software stack. But the key insight that, we, that we've implemented is expose the concurrency all the way through. And so we've exposed that concurrency. What it allows is our, our sort of backend database layer 
to have placement and scheduling control. And the net effect of that for customers is that we can reduce tail latencies, we can get much better efficiencies. So rather than in a traditional SSD, you have over provisioning, right? So there, that because that SSD is its own little database system doing a flash translation layer, it's got system space and metadata and it's doing garbage collection sort of behind our back. We remove all of that. We do garbage collection in our database. We have direct uh, you know, visibility into the flash so we can monitor the health of individual components do re you know, fine grained repair. And we don't need to over provision at the system level as much. And so this is one of the ways, you know, Enrico to your earlier question, uh, this is one of the ways that we've been able to ride the technology curve. This is why we can build a 52 terabyte blade is because we can efficiently attach all this media and yet still get access to the, you know, highly concurrent, uh, you know, individual elements therein. So what does that mean to a customer? I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And I actually want to start with a smaller scale customer. because I think this is something that at times can be underappreciated. We're talking about massive, we're talking about 75 blades. Let's, let's talk about a 12 blade system. This is a state government, it's an unemployment agency uh, that had a growing elastic search cluster. And so distributed database effectively at the application layer, uh, challenged their IT team from a operational complexity point of view. And so they brought in uh, FlashBlade as a simple disaggregated compute storage uh, architecture approach. The graph on the upper right of this visual really highlights some of this you know, performance as well as simplicity that we've hit for this customer. They loaded, they went from racked, cabled, you know, initial deployment to 250 terabytes of data, you know, sitting on, on their flash blade in under 10 days. So a quarter, quarter of a petabyte loaded, this is a state government, you know, this is not uh, a massive scale uh, high tech organization, but they have modern data needs. And the kinds of performance, so the, the visual at the bottom, this is taken from our Pure One is our cloud-based uh, monitoring system that all customers have access to. And this visual is taken from you know, a couple of days ago, uh, random Tuesday, uh, what, what their system looked like. You can see it's a couple of gigabytes a second of reads, a couple of gigabytes a second of writes, mixed. Uh, the IO sizes are all over the place. It's very random access patterns due to how the application works. And it's not a massive system, right? So we can work on the small end we can also work on the massive end. And so we've been very fortunate to have some very large scale customers that have really pushed us to get bigger, go faster, do more, do more. And, and we've really, uh, you know, the architecture that we built has really risen to that occasion. So this customer is a very large scale uh, financial services organization in New York. They make a lot of trades and therefore they do a lot of simulations. Uh, so they're doing constant risk model simulations. They started with us actually with a smaller scale system, uh, they started with a 15 blade system. Uh, these days they have, uh, in fact, four of the 75 blade systems uh, with us. They started with a workload that was doing Monte Carlo simulations. So this is looking at lots of different possible outcomes uh, for a you know, financial system. They've got well over a thousand servers that are doing the compute and all of that data is accessed. It's an application they've evolved over years so all of that is uh, shared file workloads, right? So NFS. And then early last year, they had a team that said, well, what we really need is actually some structured data to do analytics. So we want a high scale SQL data warehouse. And they turned to uh, an open source technology that came out of Facebook called PrestoDB and built a pilot system for that. It uses, it's a very cloud native application. And so it uses object storage under the covers. And so they have uh, S3 based uh, access methods for all the servers that are running. Uh, they're now up to 250 physical servers that are running this uh, database. It is massive scale. And you can see in the, the chart is again, this is a random Monday. Uh, they're routinely doing in the 30 to 40 gigabytes per second of sustained throughput in their real world, just everyday activity. So we look at customers like this, uh, and this one in particular, you know, they really typify uh, somewhat when we think about our product as a unified fast file and object platform, 
and it's it's encouraging that we've got customers that are able to hit the kind of you know that our system can support the kind of performance that they need. But when I visited with this customer in particular, you know, one of the questions I asked was, you know, why why pure? What what have we been able to do uh, besides the performance? Because that's you know in some ways it's kind of easy to talk about actually. And and said, well, actually, you know, let's be realistic for a second. You can achieve very high scale file performance. There are HPC file systems that can do this. You can lash together a, a bunch of different solutions to try to get the performance for an object source, it's a little harder. What they like about FlashBlade in their environment is that we can do that. We can do both file and object on a single platform, but we also offer the no downtime for upgrades. We've been able to massively reduce the footprint in their data center. And you know, this customer is absolutely typifies you know, something that, that we feel strongly. You know, every customer should have more petabytes than people managing a system. And if, if you need, you know, as for this kind of modern unstructured data, if you need an army of operations folks, you know, we've done something wrong and we want to know. And so in certainly in this organization, they have roughly a half of a full-time engineer dedicated to four Flashblade systems and a whole bunch of other things that are going on. And uh, it's worked out quite well for them.